In the previous episode, it was mentioned that the Whisperers killed people from the four major communities and put their heads on display along the border, crossing this line would provoke a war, so seeking revenge was off the table as it would only lead to more deaths. Three months later, winter arrived, and this year seemed colder than ever, the kingdom felt desolate. Despite hopes that the marketplace would alter the situation, the lack of manpower remained a pressing issue. Heating facilities were severely decayed, worsened by an accidental fire. The kingdom was no longer habitable, so they had to move. Otherwise, they would not be able to survive the winter. Folks from other communities came to aid in the safe passage to the hilltop. As they walked out the gates, the people were overcome with sadness. This was their home. After all, Ezekiel was particularly distressed. Having poured his heart into building this community, he now had to depart. Unlikely to return, the convoy moved slowly along the road. Michonne inquired about the hilltop situation. Yumiko said that despite the three months that had passed, people were still grieving, they are still without a leader, they have written to Maggie. All eyes turned towards the distance at that moment. A few zombies roamed the field, unmistakably being monitored by the whisperers. This upset Alden so much that he started to say something sarcastic, something along the lines of, haven't the bloody whisperers done enough to them? He directed his comments while keeping an eye on Lydia. It's a good thing Daryl spoke up in time for Alden to say anything. During this time, the way people looked at Lydia was notably strange. Considering the number of lives lost for her, some even spoke ill of her. It's a good thing Daryl's been around to defend Lydia. Even Carol was no exception. Every time she saw Lydia, thoughts of her son Henry came rushing in. Henry wanted her here. And no one else did. She's a good kid. Every time I look at her, all I see is him. What do you see when you look at me? I see you. Ezekiel, who was ahead, overheard the conversation between the two and looked back. Witnessing the scene, he didn't say anything, instead engaging Jerry in a weather-related discussion. It seems likely that heavy snow is on the way. It didn't take long for snow to fall. In just half an hour, they blanketed the landscape in a pristine white. At the roadside, two zombies appeared, drawn by the noise. Shuffling toward them, Daryl and Carol each took aim and dispatched them with arrows. Carol was about to go over to retrieve her arrow, but Ezekiel told her to go on ahead that he could take care of it. Lydia saw that their attention was drawn away from the zombies and no one was paying attention to her, so she disappeared under the cover of the carriage. In fact, Ezekiel was deliberately trying to distract Carol. He confided in Daryl, I don't want to be the bad guy, but I'm going to say it. It's been a rough time for Carol and I. We'll start over when we get to the hilltop. Yet, I hope it's just the two of us. Implicitly, he hoped Lydia wouldn't stay there. To avoid causing further heartache, there was another layer to his meaning, he wanted Daryl to leave as well. He doesn't want his wife to give her attention to someone else. Daryl gave Ezekiel a disdainful glance, then turned and rejoined the larger group. Lydia, on the other hand, heads off into the woods alone when no one's looking. She didn't know where she was going, she just wanted to separate from the group. It wasn't until she stumbled upon a small frozen pond, with a zombie trapped in the ice. Lydia slowly moved forward, the ice supporting her weight. As she faced the zombie, which could only move its mouth, she crouched down, seemingly making a decision. For the past three months, others' gazes had been accusatory, and Lydia had been mired in self-blame and guilt. Mum killed so many good people, including Henry, who she loved, and it made it impossible for her to face them. She thought maybe ending it all was better, so she extended her hand toward the zombie's mouth. Eyes closed, ready to put an end to it all. Right as the zombie was about to bite, Lydia heard footsteps behind her. And when she looks back, it's Carol. The two of them looked at each other without saying a word. Seeing Lydia in this state, Carol comprehended that the young girl was also grappling with deep self-blame. A few minutes later, Carol returned to the road with Lydia. The others were discussing their next moves. Due to the intensifying snow, even pushing through the night wouldn't get them to the hilltop. It seemed better to find a place to rest for now. A few of the older members thought of a place to rest at the same time, which was the former Salvation Hall. New member Magna couldn't believe that people had actually lived in this place before. Because at this moment, the Salvation Hall is in a state of disrepair and dilapidation. In the Alexandria Security Zone, a group of people gathered in a house. This was one of the few places in the community, along with Aaron's house, 
with a closet. They had to come here to get warm. Gabriel brought Negan along, saving him from freezing in his cell. Negan started talking a lot more since he had so many people with him, but Judith was the first one to stop Negan when he talked dirty. All Negan could do was keep apologizing. He had a soft spot for the little guy. Judith sat by the window, watching. She was there because Uncle Daryl had asked her to look after the dog. However, the dog had disappeared with the onset of the heavy snow. Negan felt something amiss, he caught a scent in the air, while others thought he was just stirring up conversation and scolded him to quiet down. Eugene's brow furrowed. Get away from there. Blizzard's done some tearing and blaring, and our chimney's ventilation capabilities are nil to none. It'd be unwise to spark a, another blaze, lest we plan on ceasing all respiratory functions, aka smoking and choking. God, I missed you, Eugene. I can't say the same. Without a place to build a fire, it's going to be hard to get by on this bedding alone. Young people are fine, but there are old people and children here. So Gabriel decided to move the group to Aaron's house before it got colder. It's a little smaller, but at least there's a closet. Seriously? Not one of you assholes is gonna untie me? We could tell Michonne it was an accident. It's just a joke. Of course, with the storm outside, Eugene brought a rope, ensuring everyone held on tight to avoid leaving anyone behind. Prepared, Eugene opened the door. The wind was bitterly cold, and Eugene could barely see the road ahead as he led the way with his torch. The good thing is that this is, after all, where they've lived for many years, so they should be able to get there safely with experience. In the distance, a dog's bark echoed. Judith left the group and ran toward the sound, quickly disappearing into the snowstorm. Negan, without a second thought, disregarded his own comfort and followed suit. But the blizzard was too heavy, and the visibility was only two to three meters. Negan shouted for Judith repeatedly, receiving no response, while he prayed fervently for her safety. Suddenly, a wooden plank struck Negan's leg, likely drawing blood. Nonetheless, he struggled to his feet, continuing to call out for Judith. Judith still hadn't responded, but the sound of a dog barking echoed in the distance. Megan could only limp over to check. Fortunately, Judith was there. In the process of putting a leash on the dog, Megan scooped up Judith and began making his way back. The snow was even heavier now, erasing the footprints they had left earlier. They had to rely on their instincts to find their way. After a while, Megan's strength waned, and the wound on his leg throbbed, forcing him to stop and rest for a bit. On Michonne's end, they began to sense the intensifying snowstorm. If they follow the planned route, the roads will probably be blocked. Carol suggested that since even the river was frozen, they could cross through the woods instead. Others acknowledged the proximity of this alternative, but it would mean traversing Alpha's designated territory head-on. Carol, because of her son's death, doesn't recognize any dividing line at all. Michonne agreed with this approach. Sneaking through during the night, they believed they might go unnoticed. It was better than dying on the road. Night fell, and the party set out, and it was not long before they reached this sad place. A few months ago, the heads of their loved ones and friends hung from the branches here. Passing through, each of them was weighed down by heavy hearts. Entering the Whisperer's territory, everyone was cautious. Soon, figures emerged ahead. This winter was bitterly cold, freezing even the zombies into ice sculptures. Michonne stepped forward and slashed twice. The zombie's head was crushed in an instant. Given the cold weather, the Whisperers were unlikely to appear. Daryl signaled for the rest to hurry through the Whisperer's territory. The rest of the journey didn't present much danger. Ten minutes later, they reached the riverbank smoothly. Daryl prepared to test the thickness of the ice to see if it could bear their weight. Michonne was right behind him, pulling Daryl by the hand so she could pull him back if the ice broke. Daryl gave the ice a forceful stomp. It was thick enough, and as long as they kept a distance, it should hold. While everyone's attention was on the frozen surface, Lydia slipped away once more, unnoticed. Daryl confirmed the ice's safety and looked at the group. Just as they were preparing to cross the river, zombies suddenly emerged from the snowy ground. Several warriors took care of them while Ezekiel organized the others to quickly cross the river. He also reassured them not to panic or crowd, or they would only make the ice on the river unbearable. The zombies in the snow are quickly disposed of. Luckily, there aren't too many of them. However, the commotion attracted nearby zombies. Five minutes later, everyone had reached the other side, except for Carol, who went to find Lydia. Daryl covered the rear. At this moment, 
A zombie emerged from the snow and approached Daryl. Daryl was about to approach and kill it when another zombie grabbed his leg from the snow, refusing to let go. He had to use his crossbow to break free, but was pounced upon by another approaching zombie, with no weapon in hand. Daryl was helpless against the zombie. Daryl then notices the ice pick above his head. He tries to reach it but he's always a bit short. Carol, who pursued Lydia, eventually found her in a small house. Lydia thinks there's no hope in life now. She questioned what crossing the river would truly change. Lydia confides in Carol, saying that Henry says she's a good person, but she's not. As long as she remained part of their group, there would never be peace for them. You know I'm right. The only way to solve their problems is to kill her. Her mother had killed Henry, and Carol should take revenge. Especially since they were in a place where no one would ever find out. With that, Lydia picked up Carol's spear and aimed it at her own neck. In that moment, Carol truly accepted Lydia. Perhaps if her own daughter hadn't died, she would be around Lydia's age. The next evening, the group, after enduring hardships, finally reached the hilltop. From then on, the residents of the kingdom joined forces with the hilltop to strive for a better future. That night, everyone had to temporarily rest in the mansion. Accommodation arrangements would be sorted out later. Carol stood by the window, a sad expression on her face. She might have been missing Henry or contemplating the path ahead. Carol didn't look at Ezekiel. She quietly mentioned, I'm going to Alexandria tomorrow with you. But I will never stop loving you. And I'll never regret the fairy tale. That's where the real home is. After all these years, since Henry's death, Carol sensed a lingering resentment from Ezekiel. Though he restrained himself from exploding, this explained his words to Daryl during the day. Carol then removed her ring and offered it back to Ezekiel, but he refused. With this, the two officially parted ways peacefully. The next day, Michonne returned to the Alexandria safe zone with a few companions. Judith rushed up and embraced her mother, Michonne, seeing the frostbite on her daughter's face. Michonne anxiously inquired about what had happened. Lydia, curious, also took in her new home. Carol also surveyed the drastically changed Alexandria safe zone, finding it hard to believe it was the same community as before. After embracing Judith, Michonne looked ahead and spotted a young boy playing hide-and-seek with her. Many viewers are wondering where the baby in Michonne's tummy has gone. Now we're going to formally introduce him. There were only a few shots before because there weren't many. Michonne's son was named RJ. He was the only person left in this world. Besides the deceased Carl, who shared a blood relation with Rick. Michonne returns home and hears about Negan's rescue of Judith the night before. Despite the danger, she was surprised that Negan would do that. Negan said, the last time I was lying here was when Rick slit my throat. It's a funny thing. I told you I've changed a lot. Judith is also a special girl who lights my hopes like a fire. This incident altered Michonne's cold attitude toward Negan. Perhaps Negan truly wasn't the same person he once was. Winter gradually passed. Negan's words seemed to make sense. The people you see as evil they don't see themselves as evil. Everyone is fighting for survival. Striving to stay alive. Spring arrived and the Whisperers resumed their activities. They seemed to have gone elsewhere during the winter. Alpha knew her sole vulnerability was her daughter. Therefore, periodically, she had Beta correct her, all to toughen herself and steal her heart. 